Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. So uh, for most of my ministerial career, uh, and in fact, now that I think about it, I've been involved all of my life, because I guess preschool and children's and youth are singles ministries as well. I've been involved in singles ministry. And one of the occupational hazards of being in singles ministry is that you get invited to perform and go to a lot of weddings, which is great. I love weddings. They're fun. They're enjoyable. I like performing weddings. One of the things that I don't like about weddings uh, is when I get to the reception and there's dancing, which is fine. It's not because I'm a Baptist that I don't like dancing. There's this abomination that has taken place, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but it's called line dancing. <laughs> and it's one of the worst things ever. One, why do they have to be called all a slide? Electric slide, cha-cha slide. Brooks and Dunn, I'm on to you. I know the boot scoop boogie is not a slide, but it's still a slide, right? It's all sliding, sliding. So. I don't like that. One of the reasons why I don't like doing line dancing is one, because I don't know the steps. And I've realized that for me to know the steps, I have to go out there with a bunch of people who have known it since like 2002 <laughs> and look like an idiot until I figure it out. And this is just not something that my pride is willing to do. Life is kind of like, if you'll jump with me here, a line dance. There are steps to life that you're supposed to take, and apparently everybody takes them, right? You are born, you grow up, you go to school, you graduate, you get a job, you get married, you have kids, you retire, and you die. And that's the line dance that everybody does. And if somebody breaks step with the line dance, everybody's kind of looking at you like people look at me doing a line dance, like, he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing, does he? He's got no clue. He's turning left and everybody else is going right. That throws me off too. Life is hard because it's hard to know what the next step is that you're supposed to take. And you throw in there the wrinkle that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I hope, and you're trying to follow every day what God has for your life, which is usually or sometimes different than what the rest of the world is doing. So the rest of the world is doing one line dance over here, and God's calling you to like throw a wrinkle in yours. And you're like, how do we follow God in faith? How do we know what steps we're supposed to take next? Do you know? Do you ever wonder, God, what am I supposed to do next? How am I supposed to know how to follow you in faith? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how we know we can follow God in faith. We're in Genesis chapter 12, and we're wrapping up our beginnings series. We're not done with the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis keeps going, uh, but we'll be uh, in a new sermon series next week. But we're going to meet a guy today who's kind of important. His name's Abram. You might know him by his alias, Abraham, uh, but we'll call him Abram for today because that's what our text calls him. And we're talking about four things that we can focus on to know how to take the next step in faith. And the first thing we need to focus on is we need to focus on what God wants. What God wants. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So the last time that God speaks in the book of Genesis, which was not too long ago, was at the Tower of Babel. People are all trying to build, as we heard last week, they're trying to build up this tower to reach the heavens so that they can make a great name for themselves. And God's like, uh, -uh no, that's not how that's going to work. Let's go down there and confuse their language. And then before that, there's this thing called the table of nations. And the table of nations describes where all the peoples on earth come comes from. And then as you're weaving your way through the tower of Babel story, all of us, because we're, we're good Bible readers, we should be asking one question. Where is this promised person supposed to come from that's going to get rid of the curse in Genesis 3? I feel like we've taken a little bit of a sidetrack here. I thought it was going to be Noah. Apparently Noah wasn't the one. He kind of sort of did some stuff, but not really what we needed. And now what? Tower of Babel. God is then, the author of Genesis, through, or God through the author of Genesis, is getting us back on track, back onto the story and so he's walking us through the different people groups, the heirs of Shem, and we have arrived to this man named Abram. 
And what God tells Abram is to leave everyone and everything that he's ever known and go someplace that he's never seen before. Not a big deal at all, right? Do that every day. No, I do not do that every day. He tells him, you are to leave your country. Go from your country. Country is the place where he lives. It's a physical, geographical location. But he also says, and your kindred and your father's house. Now, that's a big deal. Because your kindred and your father's house back then, it's not like Abram, Abram is 75 years old and li still living with mom and dad. Like, it's not like that. It is, Abram is 75 years old and lives in a day when your socioeconomic security was with the people that you were with, was with your family, was with your tribe. And so God's calling Abram out to leave all of that socioeconomic security behind. It would be the equivalent of somebody graduating from Texas A&M with an engineering degree and going to work for his dad's company, and he's about to take over the company from his dad, and all of a sudden he decides, you know what, I'm going to sell all my interest in the company after working here for 30 or 40 years, and I'm going to go west to be an actor. <laughs> Probably a barista. <laughs> That's the equivalent of what Abraham's being asked to do. He's 75. You're not thinking startup ventures at 75. You're thinking retirements and 401ks. And God says, go. God says to go, to leave his country. And the only direction that he gets is, I'll tell you when you get there, just start walking. God is inviting Abram onto the cosmic dance floor. And he's saying, come on, I've got a dance I want to teach you. He wants him to go in faith, and he wants him to learn the steps as he goes, which is terrifying. He doesn't give Abram the whole plan. He just tells him to go and, I'll, and stop when I tell you to stop. Just take the first step. And that's really what dancing is. It starts with the first step. And honestly, this is when we get hung up following God. I think a lot of us get hung up at this point. Many of us are like me when I'm at a wedding reception, and I might already be on the dance floor enjoying my, my dancing. I don't really dance like that. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> but enjoying my dancing, and then all of a sudden I hear cha-cha slide come on, which is an, uh, a bane upon humanity. And I decide to turn around and leave the dance floor. I'm not going to hang around I'm at 35 years old. I am never going to learn the cha-cha slide. You can put it on my tombstone, 1983 to 2156. Yeah, I'm going to live that long. Never learn the cha-cha slide. Just put it on there. Because I don't want to. I don't even want to investigate it. I don't want to learn the benefits of cha-cha slide. It could cure cancer. I'm not doing it. And many of us when God calls us to do something, it's like hearing the cha-cha slide music. You're like, mm -mm, I know this one. It ain't for me. And we won't even go and investigate maybe what God has for us because we're afraid that either A, he's going to require us to pack up everything we have and move to some foreign country we've never heard of, or B, we'll have to do something that we don't want to do for the rest of our lives. Not every call from God is a call for you to pack up, leave everything you've ever known, and go somewhere else. Sometimes it is. I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes it is. I think that happens in people's lives maybe once or twice in their entire life. Maybe three times. I don't know. More often than not, though, the call is for us to do something in obedience to God. The, dance is a, uh, the, the step in the dance is a minor step. It's going across the street to a neighbor. It's seeing a sick friend. It's checking up. It's forgiving somebody. It's reconciling with them. And sometimes those can seem like bigger steps. Sometimes it can seem like a bigger deal to do small steps like that than to do the big steps. But if I investigate something, it might mean God has something for me. So how do I know the difference between the big step and the small step? Well, first, look at what God has already asked you to do. What does God already ask you to do? If you're a husband or a wife today, are you loving your spouse the way that the Bible calls you to love them? Ephesians 5 is a really good place to start for that. If, if you're a parent, are you raising your child up and discipling them in the faith, or are you trusting the church to do that for you? We can help, but we can't do it for you because you are at a decisive advantage over us. You live with your child. We do not. If you're a child, if you're a student, are you owning your faith? Are you taking an active interest in growing more and more into the image of Christ, or are you just trusting everybody else to do it for you? I was seven year old, years old when I got saved. 
I was 14 when I really felt like, oh, wait, this isn't my parents' thing. This is my thing. It was a major crossroads in my life because I sat there and thought to myself, okay, I can either go around for the rest of my life and telling people, yeah, I'm a Christian because I was raised in a Christian home, blah, 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 or I begin to follow Jesus with my life. And if you're 12, 13, 14, guess what? The time's coming for you. Maybe even younger. If you're a single adult, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Are you looking for a godly mate to spend the rest of your life with? Or are you just looking for a nightly one? Who are we looking for? And then once you know what God wants, once you follow God in faith with what you've already been asked, start looking at what God might have for you to do on top of that. Seek opportunities to take steps of faith. We don't like to seek opportunities like God's going to come and find me. Play like this cosmic hide and seek. God's omnipotent. He knows where you are, right? But we wait to God, for God to come and find us. You can go and see what God might have for you. One of the things you can do is you can read the Bible with us. Reading through the Bible every day of the year is a big commitment. Those of you who are with us in Leviticus realize this. Because I'm like, man, what have I gotten myself into? It's a tough jump on point. But go ahead. Get on board. Read with us. If you're giving, increase your giving. If you're not giving, start. As you heard TJ say, it's important. It helps us do much of the ministry, all the ministry that we do here. Get to know your neighbors. Invite them to Easter. Easter's coming up. I think it's April 26th, I believe. I think it's later this year. Invite them to Easter. I, I think we do a good Easter service here. We're not going to embarrass you in front of your friends. Invite your friends to Easter here. Let them hear the gospel. And then take them to brunch. So once we know, once we focus on what God wants, we can begin to focus on what we get out of this. Because God doesn't just want things from you without giving us anything. God has lavish gifts to give. In fact, we can then begin to focus on what God will do. Focus on what God will do. Look at verse 2. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So God just doesn't call Abram out of the wilds of the ancient world and say, hey, come follow me and figure it out. No, Abram, God tells Abram, I'm going to take care of you. He actually tells him he's going to bless him in seven ways. He says, first, I will make you a great nation. Now, this is significant, especially since we read all these other nations. So if you're the reader and you're reading this for the first time, you're thinking, oh, God's promising to make Abram like one of these other groups and make him great. That's cool. That's a big deal. He says he's going to bless them. He's going to bless Abram. This means material wealth and offspring. Material wealth and offspring. Make your name great. This is the opposite of what the folks at Babel do. The folks at Babel try to make for themselves a name. And God's like, you don't have to do this. I'll take care of it for you. I'll make your name great. He says you're going to be a blessing. This means he's going to be a mediator of blessing. That means blessing is going to go through Abram. God has picked him, has chosen him. He says he's going to bless those who bless you. This means that Abram doesn't control the blessing, but God is still going to use him. Then he says, I'm going to curse those who curse you. This means that Abram is going to be protected by God. God's saying, I got your back. You don't worry about it. Because everywhere you go, you're going to encounter difficulty and, and trials because not everybody follows me. So guess what? I'm going to protect you. I'm going to watch over you. And then he says, all the families of earth will be blessed. Basically, your legacy is going to be incredible. Incredible. God asks something of Abraham, of Abram. He asks him to leave. But he promises so much more to Abram than that one simple step. If Abram will just step out on the dance floor and start trying to learn the steps to the dance that God has for him, God says the rewards are going to be incredible. He's asking Abram to go on a journey with him. And the tension is, is Abram going to do it? And as you read the story of Abraham throughout Genesis, the question resurfaces again and again. It's almost a, a, a chapter by chapter question. Is Abraham going to follow him here? Is Abraham going to follow him through this? Is Abraham going to do this? Is Abraham going to do this? And the question always is yes. Yes, culminating with Abraham sacrificing his son and God stops him and says, now I know. Now you've proven yourself to trust me wholly. That's why in Genesis 15, 6, when God promises an unconditional covenant to Abraham, 
It says that Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This today is how we follow God. God has a lot of promises for us. He has a lot of promises for you today. And when we believe God that he will deliver on these promises, that's what faith is. It's trusting him to do what we cannot see. So when it comes time for us to step out on the dance floor with God, the details are often different, but the ask is the same. It's, will you trust me? Do you believe me? Do you believe that God wants to bless you? And not with earthly wealth and like physical offspring. We're in the age of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God is, is eternal wealth, eternal riches. And the offspring that God wants to give you are disciples, followers of Jesus that you can train and raise up. Some of them might be your own children. Some of them might be other people. Do you believe that God wants to make your name great? And not in a culture of selfies and Instagram, but a name that is known by God himself. That's why in Revelation it says to have your name put in the Lamb's book of life, to be known by Jesus Christ is the greatest name you can have. It's all the name recognition you need. Do you believe that God wants to bless others through you as he blessed others through Abram? We live in one of the wealthiest parts of the world. You can't tell me that the reason why we have what we have is so that we can keep it and pass it down to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. We have what we have to bless the world around us. And that goes for wherever you live. I'm not talking about just Highland Park and the Park Cities. Like Highlands. I live in Lockwood. I'm talking about us too. Plano, Richardson, Frisco. Guess what? We're blessed to be a blessing. Do you believe that God says he will protect you and watch over you? And when you take that step of faith that God's with you, do you believe that through you and the church that you're a part of the world might be blessed? Do we believe those things? Do we believe those promises? Here's the thing. We often focus on God's commands to the exclusion of his promises. We ignore his... Do you think when Abram was traveling west with his whole family and laying down at night, this often happens to me. I think about like, wow, what did I do wrong today? Because my mind likes to do that to me, right? You've had all day to, to tell me I'm an idiot. Now you choose this time, right? So when I'm laying down or when Abram's laying down, he's probably thinking to himself, God, is this the right thing to do? Like I haven't heard from God like since that night. I don't, I don't know. And I guarantee you one of the things that kept him going was not, well, I'm probably going to be in trouble if I don't go, so shoot, I guess I'll keep going. No, it's probably, man, if this is true, if this is real, this is going to be incredible. It's worth the trip. Y'all, it is worth it. The promises of God are so incredible that it is worth it for us to step out on the dance floor in faith and follow him. It's worth it. Do you think, do you believe 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says that God will provide a way out of temptation? Or do we just give in to temptation because, well, if I don't give in now, I'll just give in later, so I might as well do it. Is that your attitude and your approach? Or are you trusting God for this moment, and then when the next moment comes, you'll trust him then too? Do you believe that Jesus died to pay for all of your sin, past, present, and future? Or do you think that like you have to, Jesus kind of got your foot in the door, and now you got to prove you're worthy? Because that's not how it works. It's not how salvation works. Jesus either did it all for you, or he didn't do any of it for you. Do you believe Luke 9, 26? That Jesus Christ is returning one day, and he's going to set the world right. Or do we put our trust and our faith in politicians and being on the right side of history? Is that what we care about? When we focus on God's promises and trust him to do what he says, we become obedient out of love. It doesn't become something that's drudgery. It becomes a joyful, invigorating dance that's life-giving to us and life-giving to the people around us if it's done out of love. I know you're hurt. I know you're hurting. I know your life might be a wreck. But God is calling you to trust him. I know you might be tired. I know you might be lonely. I know you might be tired of being lonely. God is calling you to trust him, to step out in faith and trust him. When you're thinking of giving up, whether it's giving up on a marriage or a friend, a family member, maybe even yourself, like if you're contemplating suicide, guess what? The church is here for you. God is here for you. Come talk to me. I want to help you. Do not give up. Keep learning the steps of the dance in faith. 
Focus on God's promises. But sometimes it's hard. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it's hard to focus on God's promises. Because what I wind up doing is I focus on all the reasons why it shouldn't work. You know what I mean? Like I focus on all the things that like make me disqualified. Like I'm not the most holy person or I haven't done the right thing or you know, I've made a bunch of mistakes in my life or I can't do math. That's usually the one that pops up in my head is I just can't do math. So instead, what we should do is we should focus on what God can do. So we focused on what God wants. We focused on what God will do. Now let's focus on what God can do. Look at verse 4. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. That's a man, not a, not a lot. Not a lot of stuff went with him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Morah, and at that time the Canaanites were in the land. So Abram believes God, and he takes that first step. He goes out, and these two verses are really interesting. What I like about these two verses is it's something unique that we haven't gotten yet in the book of Genesis. We learn a lot of information about who Abram is. We learn his wife's name. Noah is one of eight people that gets saved, and we never learn who his wife is. We don't know what her name is. It could be Betty, for all we know. But she's one of eight people saved. No idea who she is. But we learn a lot of things about, Noah, or about Abram here. We learn he has a relative who we met in the, originally in the, chapter 11, verse 31, but Lot goes with him. We learn that his wife, Sarai, is still alive, and she's going too. We learn he's 75 years old, which is not 75, and he's going to grow up to be like 930. Like 75 at this point is pretty much 75, right? He's an older gentleman. We also learn that he is already materially blessed. He has stuff, he has people that work for him, and we learn that he's going to Canaan. And all of these things, you may think, oh, that's cool biographical information. Guess what? All of these things are potential obstacles to Abram trusting God in faith. All of these are reasons for him to say, "Mm -mm, no, not me. God, you need to find somebody else. Hey, have you met my, my nephew Lot? He's younger, and you could easily change his name to a lot, and it would be cool. It would show that you blessed him. Right? God likes to change people's names. But no, there are obstacles with, within Abram himself. There are obstacles in his family, and there are obstacles in the place that he's going. Let's look at the obstacles with Abram. Chapter, five, or chapter 12, verse 4. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram is old. Again, sorry if you're 75 or older, but he's older. Again, you don't want to go on a journey that long, I know. Walking? What? It's not a great time to start a new business venture. You don't want to go like that at 75. I don't want to do that now, and I'm 35. Right? <laughs> On top of that, Abram's wife is not a spring chicken herself. We find out later on that she's about the same age as Abram. And when they have their son, Isaac, they're both well into their 90s. Well into their 90s. So they don't have a child. We know they don't have a child because one, none is listed here. But two, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 3, Abram actually complains to God and says, what are you going to give me? I don't even have a son. So all my stuff that you're going to give me is supposed to go to some guy that's not even my relative. And God says, I'm going to take care of that for you. His nephew, Lot, that comes with him, gets abducted by, uh, by some kings and Abram actually has to go to war and rescue him. And then Lot also takes some of the land that's supposed to be his, some really good choice land, and takes it for himself because there's conflict. Abram, when he dies, dies having, well, two sons, he has some sons, but the, the son of the promise is one, his name is Isaac, and he owns one piece of property in the entire promised land. And you know what it is? It's a tomb where he buried his wife. That's all he owns when he dies. Was God unfaithful? God is promising it to him and to his descendants. And we see that promise being poured out again and again and again. But if I'm honest, it seems like God picked the wrong dancing partner. Like if it were me, I would have picked somebody younger. Oh, you're going to give him a son? Well, here, here's two 20-year-olds that are perfectly capable of doing this on their own. But that's not how God works. God likes to stack the deck against himself. 
Because at the end of the day, what God wants is glory for his name. And if he's calling you to do something that you think, oh man, there's no way I can pull that off. Great, guess what? God wants the glory. So at the end of the day, when you do something there's no way you could have done on your own, he can say, yeah. And everybody around you can be like, whoa. And you can be like, to God be the glory because there's no way that I could have done that. God calls us to things that are difficult and challenging because God wants the glory. And this is why God chooses Abram. He's going to teach an old dog new tricks. He's going to teach him. But it's not just Abram who's got kind of the problem and the baggage and his family's got some baggage. The place where he's going also has some baggage. Look again at verse 5. Verse 5. And he took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak at Morah. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So in case you're wondering, it's called Canaan because it has Canaanites. So Abram isn't basically going to walk up to the border of, the Can- of Canaan and say, Boomer sooner, nobody's here. I'm just getting squatters right. And I'm just going to charge in and take everything I've got. No, there are tons of people there. And they're well organized. They've got some major cities, places like Byblos and, and Megiddo. There's a place called Ai. It's got all sorts of places. Shechem. It's not like Abram's going to walk in and be like, all right, everybody, I've heard from my God, and he's told me this is all mine, so get to stepping. This is, this is my stuff. That's not how it works. In fact, if I'm Abram, the whole way I'm going, I'm praying and be like, God, you better hurry up with that nation because I'm going to need it to take over this whole place. But Abram keeps going. He keeps trusting God despite the obstacles that are present before him. He's trusting in God's power. He's trusting in what God can do. He's trusting that God can give him a child through his wife. He's trusting God to give him a child through his body. He's trusting God to give him a land that there's no way he can take over on his own. But so often we think to ourselves, nah, God, you better find somebody else. You better find somebody else. I've heard this before from single adults. So don't be mad at me for saying this because I've heard this actually out of their mouth. Sometimes uh, single adults will say, oh, I shouldn't do that. I can't do that. I can't take that leadership position. That's for a real adult. Guess what? You're a real adult. And on top of that, if you think that making you a real adult is because you got married and had kids, that's wrong. Have you seen Teen Mom? (laughs) They're not adults. You want to know what makes you an adult? Are you ready? I'm going to tell you. Kids, everybody, here it is. What makes you an adult, according to Scripture, is following God in faith, no matter how old you are. Stepping out onto the dance floor with God to follow Him in faith is what makes you an adult. And when we don't do that, we're children. And not the good childlike faith kind of children, but like petulant temper tantrum children. Following God in faith. Maybe some of you in here are thinking, man, I'm so looking forward to August. My last kid's leaving the house, empty nesters. All my time is about me. Nope. God is asking you to step out in faith and continue to help cultivate the next generation of the followers of Christ. Don't rest on your laurels. There is no retirement in following Jesus. I am a father of a two-year-old. I got one on the way. I would love in wisdom on how to raise my daughters in the faith. I would love to know mistakes that you've made so that I might avoid them. If you're a student and you're looking ahead to college and, and, and what life has for you, you're doing the line dance of life that we described earlier, but you're thinking that maybe God wants you to do something else. I'm going to make a lot of parents angry at me here today. I'm looking forward to your emails. Have you thought about maybe not going to college right away? Have you thought about going on a gap year mission trip? Have you thought about going somewhere? Guess what? College will be here when you get back. And we might have actually figured out a way to pay for it. Go somewhere where the gospel... Have you ever thought that maybe you're being called into ministry? We don't talk about that much either. But what if God is calling you now, someone that doesn't, that's maybe a little afraid, a little tepid to jump out on the dance floor with God, and God is actually calling you today to learn how the steps of the dance so that you might teach other people the steps of the dance. You're going from two left feet to dance instructor. And what if that's what God has for you? And maybe it's here in the States. Maybe it's in a different culture. I think you should go to college. Don't get me wrong. But you don't have to go to college right away. 
If we're going to follow God onto the dance floor, we have to learn a dance that sometimes looks different than the rest of the world. At some point, you are going to have to say to the line dance of life, that's not the way I'm going to dance today. I'm following Jesus. Sometimes they'll line up. Sometimes they'll look alike. But sometimes they won't. And if you look at your life and you're like, wow, my life looks a lot like everybody else's life. Are we really following Jesus? Are we really following him onto the dance floor? Or if we wound up somewhere else, are we just a wallflower? So if I've done my job, you're scared to death right now, which is good. So you might be thinking to yourself, Travis, I, I want to do this. What, what do I do first? What do I do first? Well, you need to focus on the dance itself with God. Focus on the dance with God. Let's look at verse uh, chapter 6. So Abram passed, sorry, verse 6. Abram passed through the land at the place at Shechem to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he's saying, this is it. I'm showing you the land. This is it. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Okay, so this, if you're reading it, you're thinking to yourself, man, this is just a travel itinerary. It's boring. It's actually really cool. Because Abram is going from place to place, and he's visiting pagan worship spots. And you're thinking, oh, wow, that's bad. Not really. Because Abram is going to these places, and he's worshiping Yahweh there. And because he's worshiping Yahweh there, you know what he's actually doing? He's spiritually conquering the land. He's like, I don't know that I can take this over physically, but I can basically go on the world's longest prayer walk and claim victory the whole way through. The Oak at Mora is a fertility cult, they think. And so Abram goes there perhaps to pray for a child, but instead of praying to the God of the Oak of Mora, he prays to Yahweh to give him a child. And God appears to him there. He honors that appearance. Abram's basically on a long, long prayer walk, and it's cool. No matter where you are on your dance with God, it has to start somewhere. And the place where it needs to start is you need to focus on who he is and who you are in relationship to him. Some of you may not know Jesus. You might be new to this whole Christian thing. You just wandered into a church. You thought this was a Starbucks and you got hoodwinked and so here you are. We, don't, we, we have some coffee. Just help yourself. But maybe you don't know who Jesus is. You're like, I, I don't know. Maybe God has brought you in here today to encourage you to take a step of faith, one that you've been putting off for a long time. Because the fulfillment of the promise to Abram, the nation, the offspring, all that stuff, is actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the promised seed, the guy that I mentioned in Genesis 3 that's supposed to overturn the curse and fix everything. That's Jesus. And he died on the cross to fix that for us. And so now he wants to adopt you into God's family. And the way that we get adopted into God's family is by believing and trusting that Jesus' sacrifice counts for us. I don't have to do good works. I don't have to earn God's approval. I don't, have to earn, I don't have to make God like me. That's not what, no. We trust that Jesus Christ has done everything we need to do. So if you've ever been in Sunday school and you did the Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had. Here we go. You know why it says I am one of them and so are you? Why we are children of Abraham? Because like Abraham, we believe God and it is credited to us as righteousness. We believe in Christ, and it is credited to us as righteousness. And so we trust him. We trust Christ. We don't trust in our works. We don't trust in what we can do. We don't, we don't hold back our trust thinking God might pull the rug out from us. You give him everything you have. You put all your eggs in one basket. You don't diversify your accounts. You put everything into Jesus Christ, and he will not disappoint you. He will not let you down. And if you do know Jesus Christ, guess what you do? The dance isn't any different. Every day is me putting my faith and trust back in Jesus Christ again and again and again. Maybe not for salvation, although that's there. But for my daily bread, my daily walk, my, my life. If I'm honest, I feel like failure follows me around. Like, like Abram's moving around, you know, I feel like failure just kind of follows me around. And I feel guilty and ashamed and bad and... But when I'm trusting in the Lord, when I, and I'm trusting in Him, when I'm, I know He's a good Father, and I know He cares for me, and I know that He forgives me. 
And so God is inviting you on to the dance floor today. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm, Travis, really, like, I'm not, this isn't for me. Have you ever watched Dancing with the Stars? You don't have to admit to that. It's okay. Or Dancing with the People Who Used to Be Stars? Most of those people are terrible dancers. I think they spend time talking about that. But somehow, amazingly, these people become really creative and good dancers. At least that's what my mother tells me. And you know why they get so good? It's not because they're good dancers. It's because the person that they're dancing with is a professional dancer who spends a lot of time with them teaching them the steps of the dance and making them look really good. Jesus Christ has invited you into a dance. And he's really good. And we're going to step on his feet. We're going to mess things up. We're going to miss the, we're going to do that. We're going to turn left when everybody else turns right. We're going to mess things up. And he's going to, he's going to take you. He's going to look at you. I'm going to lift your chin up and he's going to say, it's okay. I forgive you. Eyes right here. Let's try again. And let's try again. And let's try again. He's never going to kick you off the dance floor. And if you read Genesis 15, you realize that God has unconditionally covenanted himself, agreed with Abram, that he's going to be with him. He's going to be his God forever. And like I said, that promise translates down through the ages to us because we are children of Abraham in faith, trusting in Jesus Christ. He's never going to abandon you. So whatever he's calling you to do today, step out in faith and do it. Do it. Get on the dance floor. It's the only time you're going to hear in a Baptist church to get out on the dance floor and dance and dance with the King of Kings. He's invited you there. So we dance by focusing on what God wants. And we focus on what he's going to do for us. And we focus on what he can do when we're doubting and struggling. We focus on the dance. And it's a dance of joy, of celebration, of love. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have invited us into a glorious cosmic dance of the divine. And it's a dance that was perfect in the Trinity. It just was beautiful and going. And you said, no, we're going to open up the dance floor. We're going to have other people come and be a part of this dance. We're going to have men and women made in our image to dance with us. And so here we are, Lord God, your people, your dancers. And we're here to worship, Lord God. And so we ask and pray that you would build our lives, that you would construct a firm foundation resting on your Son and through your Spirit building up more and more, encouraging us to take the steps that we need to step. Pick us up when we fall. Dust us off when we get dirty. And guide us to follow you every day. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.